In today's episode of The Rig Doctor, we're going to be looking at The Rig Doctor then and now. Back in 2014, I did a video with my good friends over at Guitar Player Magazine when they used to be local here in the Bay Area, where they asked me if I would do a rundown of my top tips on how to build a great DIY pedal board. And I want to see how much my opinion back in 2014 have changed now that we're you know, almost at the end of 2019. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to kind of compare and contrast how I've evolved as a builder and whether some of these best practices have changed over time or whether like the Paul Rivera interview that we just did a couple of weeks ago, whether we're dealing with the same problems as they were back in 1974. Before we get into this, if you like the type of stuff that we're putting out and you haven't subscribed already, I really suggest that you subscribe and ring the bell icon. That just means that you're going to get up to date with all the new stuff that we're putting out moving forward. But I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's get into it. My name is Mason Marangella. I build rigs for the industry's top professionals. Now I'm teaching guitarists how to build rigs like the pros with DIY tips, easy mods, and all the tricks of the trade. I am the Rig Doctor. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you a little section of the video and then I'm going to go back and sort of analyze maybe how my opinion has changed or how it may be completely different based on what we saw in that old video that I did at Guitar Player Magazine versus what I think now. The first thing that I talk about in the video is about buffers. The first thing that I, I recommend to anybody doing their own pedal boards is the necessity of having a buffer in their signal. And buffers have caught a bad reputation in the past, but they're really valuable to have if you want to get the closest representation of your guitar plugged directly into your amplifier. One thing to recognize though with, with buffers is that not all are created equal and buffers that are inside of pedals that are kind of doubling as being independent buffers and are also, for example, let's say a distortion pedal, those may not be the best buffers in order to drive a long line of cable effectively without introducing noise or having any degradation in the signal. So I typically recommend that people get isolated buffers that are that their only job is to buffer. And that is really important to have on the input of your system. So the first thing you plug into ideally would be an input buffer. And also the last thing that you would want to plug into should be an output buffer. In this way, you are controlling the most variables um, as far as inconsistencies on the pedal board where every pedal has a different input and output impedance and you're dealing with a variety of different variables that you really try to avoid if you want to get the closest sound to your guitar plug directly into your amp. So tip one, definitely invest in getting an input buffer and an output buffer, preferably dedicated, not something that's combined with a pedal that also has a buffering quality to it. Now, I just put out a video regarding buffers, the best practices, and where to use them. And the funny thing is, is in this Guitar Player Magazine video, I actually used the word, or the sentence rather, not all buffers are created equal. And I haven't referenced this in several years, so it was sort of ironic to me that that was in the title and thumbnail of the video that I put out about buffers because not all buffers are created equal. And I pretty much say almost the exact same thing that I said in the buffer video that I made around the need to have an input and an output buffer in order to isolate the guitar from the pedal board and in order to isolate the pedal board from your amplifier so that you have the least amount of impact sonically with whatever's going on on the pedal board from the things that are, that are external to that. So I was actually pretty surprised to find that my own you know, description of why a pedal board needed a buffer and why all buffers were not created equal that was surprising to me that not only did I, you know, have that, you know, that idea back then, but I almost said the exact same thing verbatim now. So in terms of buffers, it appears as though my opinion has not changed, that I still believe that a buffer is very important. And I've been having lots of discussions over the last few weeks since that video has come out 
about the best buffers that are out there that are commercially available. Now on this pedal board that you saw in the Guitar Player Magazine video, that was built custom for one of my clients out in Australia. But now there's a lot more options than what were available then if you wanted to have a kind of pre-made over-the-counter type buffer. And as always, I'm a really big proponent of the Mesa Boogie Highwire. I think it's a great, great buffer and designed by one of the guys that was kind of one of the, you know, the, the real architects of kind of building standalone buffers back at the time that this video was shot, which is Mario Marino from Axis Electronics, who now works for Mesa Boogie. So he really invested a lot of his knowledge in things that he came to understand through the, the you know making and the process of making that buffer that he really applied into the Mesa Boogie unit and just has you know several more years and a lot more understanding of buffers. So that's a really, really great standalone buffer that I highly recommend. But let's go on to the next part of the guitar player video and see where I stand now. So in this next part, I talk about the need for soldered cables. Always go with soldered cables whenever possible. So if you have the means to buy a lot of these solderless cable kits, you can definitely afford to buy some of the solderable cable. And if you don't have the, the skill or technical ability to do it, there are a myriad of YouTube um, channels that offer assistance on how to solder and, it, and it's it's pretty easy once you get the hang of it. I think if you did 10 plugs and soldered and terminated those, I think you'd be set and I think you'd be a lot happier with the results. Really inexpensive cable to buy that is really easy and maneuverable on a pedal board would be the Mogami 2319. So I would say that would be the easiest uh, to solder and to work with on a pedal board context. And as far as connectors, which are the quarter inch ends that you plug in the inputs and outputs of your pedals, uh, a really great place to get those inexpensively is um, orangecountyspeakerrepair.com. And they offer inexpensive uh, quarter inch connectors and they have pancake versions, which are the flatter versions of uh, pedal board interconnectors that you see. They also have standard right angle and straight, depending on what your needs are. And I would recommend that pairing because it's very inexpensive, less than a dollar a connector. And for the 2319 from Ogami, that's maybe 50 cents a foot. And uh, it will be a much better result using soldered connection than it would to be using solderless. And the main reason why that is, is that you have a lot of resistance in a non-soldered line. And you also have a lot of exposure to elements that are possible in addition to some of the reliability issues that can occur as a result of not having a hard soldered connection between the cable and the plug. My opinion on soldered cables, as many of you who've been watching a lot of these episodes, has not changed between 2014 and now. I still highly recommend that people use soldered cables whenever they can. The main issues with using solderless cables primarily is that they're not a gas tight connection and you're in an environment when you're making music with other people where in actuality, you're gonna have vibration, you're gonna have movement. If you're moving or plugging in or unplugging any sort of cables, there's gonna be movement inside the cable itself. There's gonna be movement inside the housing. This even goes for soldered cables. And then at a, not having a gas tight connection on top of that, you're just adding insult to injury on something that is already being vibrated and moved and we have solderless cables, it's just asking for a problem. This is why you do not see professional rig builders that have been doing this for any length of time ever using solderless cables. They're all using hardwire connections. This is from the original rig builders back in the Paul Rivera era, up through Robert Bradshaw, Dave Friedman, the guys over at Exact Tone, uh, our good friend Brian over at A Million Audio. All these guys are all using exclusively soldered cables because it's the only connection that they can depend on being used in different environments, different humidities. And again, a solder connection is the only connection that is gas tight. Even if solderless companies make claims that they have a gas tight connection, which I don't believe to be true, but if they were making that claim, it would only be at the point with which the connection was made. And then as soon as it's being moved, then it would no longer be a gas tight connection. So it is not a good idea if you can help it to use solderless cables, I highly recommend using soldered cables. And I think the Mogami 2319 for a pedal board is one of my personal favorites, but there are a few different ones that you can use if you wanna experiment. But this is the one that I recommend. I think it has the, it's the best compromise between how easy it is to assemble, how flexible it is, 
and the capacitance and specs on it are pretty great. So I highly recommend using that one if you're gonna go with a soldered cable. It's a great one and very inexpensive. And I'll even link it below here if you wanna check those out on your own. The next recommendation in the video at Guitar Player was around using dual lock as the Velcro of choice in order to adhere your pedals to a pedal board surface. I get questions all the time about how to fasten my pedals to a pedal board in a way that won't make them end up all over uh, their case uh, when they're traveling. And the best I've found in order to keep pedals on the pedal board is using a product from 3M called Duloc. And Duloc comes in a lot of different densities, but I've actually found that the trick to getting the best lock where well, you will never ever have to worry about removing a pedal or having a pedal come off in an, in an unwanted fashion is to use two different densities of dual lock. So if you go to uh, different retail stores that sell 3M products, you can see different uh, patterns of the dual lock and I usually go with uh, 180 loops per square inch and pair that with 300 loops per square inch. And that locking mechanism of having those two offset styles of loops for the to achieve the Velcro is the most effective way to keep things down. And, and I actually measured it with a tool to measure how much pressure it takes to get them to release. And I think for most of these pedals, it's around 25 pounds per square inch. So if you were using six inches of cable, you can do the math. It's pretty difficult to get off there. So it'd really have to be mishandled in order to remove any of these pedals from the pedal board without you wanting to do it. I still use Duloc to this day. I use two different densities on Duloc because I find that by offsetting or staggering the way that the loops are oriented actually creates a better fit. So what I use, I use the SJ3550, which is the looser, less dense loop on the pedal itself. And then I use the SJ3551 on the surface, and that's a little bit denser amount of loops. And then when you put those two together, you have a really, really tight fit. It's very difficult to get pedals off the board if that's the goal that you're going for. Now, some people may say, well, I'm trying to change out stuff all the time, and I don't want it that difficult to remove pedals. So you could go with a more standard Velcro in that case, but I still think that the dual lock is the best one out there. And if you need to remove it, I've also listed some of these, uh, you know, kind of upholstery plastic crowbars that you can use to remove pedals without damaging the paint. If you decide that you want to use dual lock, I still highly recommend it. It is definitely the way to go in terms of Velcro. In this next part of the guitar player video, I talk about power supplies. Always invest whenever possible in an isolated power supply that has isolated outputs and preferably uses a toroid style transformer. Um, on most of the pedal boards, I will typically use a Voodoo Lab power supply, but there are other companies that make power supplies that have toroid transformers. Other examples would be T-Rex, um, Seox. Those companies also use um, those style supplies, toroid transformers, and, um, and are typically a very low noise analog uh, linear supply. There are some other companies that make supplies that that have some isolated outputs that are also fairly good and have some switching capabilities as well and don't uh, require you to have to change power supplies if you're going to another country. So an example of that would be uh, G-Lab out of Poland. They have also a very nice supply. Um, and uh, I would recommend looking into those to get the quietest results on your pedal board. Typically, if you have a supply where many of the outputs are in parallel. You can often get noise depending on which pedals are paired in parallel. And also if an output goes down, typically you'll have the whole entire supply go down. And so this is just a much quieter and much more reliable way to do it is to get a linear isolated supply like those companies that I mentioned. I think that you'll find that it, 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 it decreases the noise and it increases the uh, the level of productivity that you can have with, with your board and not have to continue to uh, figure out where the ghosts are coming from in your pedal board in reference to noise. Now my take on power supplies hasn't changed very much. I still believe it's very important to have isolated power whenever you can. You know, you want to make sure that your pedals are as quiet as possible and by using isolated supplies you're not sharing any of the grounds amongst your pedals and you're getting nice clean power going to each of them. Now power supplies have changed quite a bit since I first made this video in 2014. And although there's a lot of the same players in the power supply game, there's a few new ones that weren't around back in 2014 that I actually prefer to the ones that I recommended back at that time. Not so much because the old ones are inferior, but they're just a little bit outdated compared to the power requirements of pedals now. 
So I really, really like, firstly, all of the True Tone products. So this is the CS12, which is the largest one, the CS7, which is sort of the midsize, or the CS6. Those are all great supplies. And at that time, they didn't have a lot of switching supplies available. The only one that I knew of at the time was made by a company called G-Lab, which is still a great supply, but there's a lot more options now. Strymon also makes a switching supply with the Zuma and the Ohi and some of their other supplies. Those are all switching supplies. And that just means that they're using high frequency to isolate all the outputs instead of having you know, individual regulators and a toroid transformer this is just a, a way that I think is, is maybe more popular in the pro audio side of things and has been used there for decades, but is just kind of now coming into the pedal industry and is becoming the standard. And those power supplies that I mentioned, again, like the Strymon ones and the True Tone ones, they're really great, they're really quiet, they're much lighter weight than the linear supplies of old, and so those would be kind of most of the Voodoo Lab ones that most of us know the classic kind of pedal power too. That's a linear analog supply. These other ones are digital supplies. Don't be freaked out by the word digital. It doesn't mean that you know, your analog pedal is gonna all of a sudden sound digital. It's just a different way of generating the power and getting it to the pedals themselves. And it is in a lot of cases much quieter than the toroid analog supply. And the cool thing I like about switching supplies is you don't have to be critical about where you put pedals in proximity. Sometimes the transformers and a lot of those linear supplies, you had to be careful because of where the magnetic field would end up. And if you didn't have a steel enclosure like on the Pedal Power 2, some manufacturers would use aluminum and there tended to be less shielding of electromagnetic. So if you put certain pedals near the power supply or on top of the power supply, you might get hum. But when you're dealing with a lot of these switching supplies, they don't have a transformer in them or they're not using the big toroid like you would find in a typical linear supply. So you don't have so much of an issue with putting pedals on top of power supplies or worrying about proximity. So there's a couple of new things that didn't exist back then that exist now that I would recommend over what I recommended in that video. So the next thing I talk about is cable dressing. And this is like dressing your power cables, your audio cables so that they're in kind of nice neat lines and in, in, in a position that makes them last the longest. So the next tip would be about uh, dressing your cables in the appropriate way. And dressing has a lot to do with the longevity of your cable and also with how how it's going to uh, look as far as an aesthetic on your pedal board. One thing that you'll notice on most of my pedal boards is I never try to put any extreme bends on any cables. When you have a lot of really, really tight angles and the pedals are, are really close together, leaving a little bit of slack so that you don't have any really tight bends on any of the connections is really important. So I usually try to make sure that everything has a little bit of relief to it and that you know if you if you move it around maybe it'll move slightly but um but it's not going to be like spaghetti on your pedal board so you definitely want to leave enough relief in your pedals where maybe you can move it slightly but you're not having a really intense angle maybe something like this would be would be kind of intense for that and probably wouldn't last long term but if it has a little bit of relief it's a little bit spongy and yet it still sits down it's tucked away that's a really good way to do it so really making sure that you don't have too hard of a break angle that's really going to help preserve the life of your cables and ensure that they're going to last for years to come. Now in the video, I talk about the importance of making sure that you don't have any extreme bends on your cables and that you dress things in such a way where it's going to you know, add to the life of the cable and not detract. Everything that I said there, I still stand by. You don't ever want to put really harsh bends, any like really tight pulls on the cable itself. You want to make sure that there is some slack in the cable itself and that just allows for some movement and some play to happen that doesn't mean that it needs to be sloppy but it needs to be enough where you can have some movement in the cable so that you don't risk breaking say the center conductor internally inside the plug or breaking the ground off inside of the plug because it's getting an extreme bend or an extreme pull i still very much recommend that you build your cables and when you're dressing them on your pedal board that you do leave a little bit of slack in the cable itself and I think I give a good visual reference there in the guitar player magazine video to show kind of the you know approximate amount that you want to have in any one particular connection when you're connecting the the cable into the actual quarter inch female jack in the pedal itself so that's definitely worth taking a look at the next thing I talk about is the importance for having the right supplies to actually keep your cables and connectors and all your power cables organized which is by using zip ties and tie down mounts so another thing to keep your pedal board really nice and neat is purchasing the the right equipment to do so and two important things that are 
just staples in in my weekly orders of materials are zip ties and tie downs. Tie downs are the square adhesive mounting tools that allows me to tie down the cable with a zip tie and adhese it to the pedal board. This is something that's really useful to keep all of the pedal, uh, the pedal board cable tucked down and away from the pedal so it's not interfering with anything. Those are something that you can easily purchase at a hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe's. And the zip ties equally can be purchased in the same place. I usually find them in the electronics section and you can purchase those there and they're very effective at helping keep things organized and helping you kind of keep things uh, tidy and neat. Now zip ties and tie down mounts are incredibly important because it allows you to keep these nice bundles of cables together so that you're not kind of chasing spaghetti all around the pedal board. Now in these days I was typically organizing the power and the audio separately from each other and kind of putting in their own runs. Today I do that when I can, but I'm not as dogmatic about it as I once was. The main reason why is that we're dealing with such low voltages and low currents comparatively to say like AC power that there's not gonna be an appreciable noise difference by putting you know, a few DC cables linked in with some of your audio cables, especially if you're using high quality shielded audio cables and high quality shielded power cables. I listed a few that I really like for power cables down in the description below, which is just the ones that are made by Voodoo Lab. They're really nice, they're very good at noise rejection, and they're very quiet and easy to work with. So if you wanna get some, I'd say look there. But having good quality zip ties, and I always get mine either from Amazon or Home Depot, and I'm gonna list those down in the description below. And I like getting the marine grade tie down mounts. Amazon does sell some that are pretty good, but there's one that I found that I like better, and I'm gonna link that in the description below as well. And they're just made for the purposes of using, say on a ship or a boat, and they can just take way more humidity, way more moisture, and way more wear and tear before they release their kind of their adhesive. And some of the ones that I've gotten over the course of time on Amazon just don't stick really well, or they tend to kind of loosen up and come off over time. And I don't think that that's the best way to have a nice, clean, and reliable looking board. So I'm gonna recommend those down in the description below if you wanna check those out. Those are the ones to get that are a marine grade version of the tie down mount. And that's just the stuff where it kind of looks like a, a little square. It has like a loop through it that you can put a zip tie to tie your cables with. And then it has an adhesive kind of sticky back that can go down on the pedal board. I still recommend those same practices. So those are definitely the ones to get. The last thing that I talk about in the Guitar Player Magazine video is about isolating and kind of a, an extension of how you dress your cables. And one thing I talk about is about the need to separate your audio and power cables from each other. And one last tip that I'll give is about when you're dressing your cables, it's very important to try to isolate your instrument cables from your power cables. So a lot of times I'll see these beautifully built homemade pedal boards that are done on various platforms, but I'll see that the instrument cables and the power cables are dressed together. And that's a real no-no. Whenever possible, you wanna make sure that your instrument cables and your power cables, if they're going to cross, you wanna make sure that they do that in a perpendicular fashion. You never want them in parallel. So you really wanna to try to eliminate them being like right on top of each other in parallel. If you can space them out and be in parallel, that's acceptable. But if they're going to be right on top of each other, if you can make sure that they are perpendicular, that's going to cause the least amount of noise and the least amount of interference of any RF or any noise getting into your audio line. So you really wanna to try to keep those away from each other as often as possible. Now on this part, I have some disagreements with myself. I actually think that I used a little bit of what some people in the industry were saying around best practices and I kind of absorbed that into my thinking and speaking around best practices in dressing power cables and audio cables. Now, when it comes to AC, if you're talking about you know, a hardwired uh, AC cable that comes out of a back of a pedal, say like an MXR flanger, like one of the original ones from the 70s, that would be something where this would hold true. You would wanna keep it as far away from any of your audio cables as possible, and if it had to cross audio, you'd wanna do it where it would be happening you know, perpendicular. But for the DC voltages that we're dealing with in pedals, nine volts for the most part, and fairly low current in almost the majority of the situations, and pedals are low current if you compare them to say pro audio equipment or things like that, anything that's, that's running on you know 100 to 500 milliamps, that's nothing in the scheme of things. Those aren't going to have a tremendous difference. And like I said in the last part, 
if you're dealing with high quality shielded instrument cables and high quality shielded DC power cables, this is not gonna be a problem. So you don't have to be as dogmatic about keeping them separate. If you can, it's great. I think from an organizational standpoint, it's actually much easier to separate the audio and the power cables. But if there's points where they have to cross, it's not like all of a sudden you're gonna have a 10 dB increase in your noise floor. It doesn't work like that. This is way too low of a current and way too low of a voltage in order to create that sort of problem. You'd have to bundle a tremendous amount of DC cables together and have some AC lines potentially running through there where you'd really notice that difference. The main things that I would just make sure is that you're using high quality shielded power cables like the ones from Voodoo Lab. And I think that you'll be in real good shape and you don't have to be quite as stringent about creating that organization. From a visual standpoint, I do think it looks better and I still try to adhere to that practice. But if I'm looking objectively at the physics of it, it's not something that is gonna have an appreciable difference if you crossed a few that weren't you know, in a perpendicular order. So that's something that I think is a clarification point that I definitely have changed my mind on between then and now. So those are my best practices reviewed back from 2014 all the way to now and you know we're almost at the end here of 2019 for the most part i was actually surprised i was impressed that a lot of things i said especially in terms of buffers were almost exactly what i'm saying now i've been saying those things for years and way back in 2014 there was nobody that had a dual buffer that was on the market i mean the, the reality was is that if you were making one you had to do it custom most of the builders at the time were just using input buffers and so I'm glad that things have changed, that people have started to see the light. I'm not taking credit for the dual buffer concept. Certainly people have thought about this before me, you know, in terms of guys like uh, Paul Rivera and things like that. But I'm glad to see that that's at least a now a more pervasive approach to making sure that you're getting good quality isolation of the impedances from the pedal board to the guitar and the pedal board to the amp so that we really can isolate that pedal board from those external factors so that it's not making any changes in the sound or at least mitigating it as much as possible. And you know, I think most of these practices, for the most part, were, were pretty much right on. I think it's sort of like what Paul Rivera said and what I said when I interviewed him is not much has changed. You know, the, the problems that we deal with, the suggestions that we're making to DIYers are pretty much the same suggestions that have been being made since the mid-70s when guys like Paul Rivera first started and were kind of the godfather of this whole pedal board craze and we can see that it's almost the same type of stuff now. So I think that's really interesting, kind of ironic, but you know, at the same time, I'm glad that we're able to continue to enrich and that we have seen some improvements even in that short time in the last five years. Even switchers and things like that have improved dramatically. I saw in that, that particular video, I was using the Crocodile Tail Looper, which was one of the best ones at the time, and now we have really fancy stuff like the RJMs, and the Musicom stuff that has really even taken that and even gone you know, a step further to improve it and make it a lot more usable for everyday musicians and really integrate stuff that used to only be available in sort of rack mounted versions with you know MIDI switchers on the floor and actually integrate them so that they can work for pedal board. So a lot of really impressive stuff is happening and I can't wait to do another one of these videos in another five years and potentially see all the crazy stuff that has happened or changed and evaluate myself against myself in uh, five years you know, previous to that, maybe I'll have a lot of gray hair by then. Certainly, I got a few more LBs on me than the last time I did this video. So we'll see where we are in a few more years. Until next time, I'm Uncle Mason, the Rig Doctor. Adios.